covered call ETFs own stocks, typically from some underlying index, and sell call options on them to generate income. Here I'll explain why they're probably not great investments for most investors. First, let's briefly review how covered calls work. Covered call writers own the underlying security and collect a premium on the options sold, providing current income. The call option written is considered covered because the underlying security is already owned. The buyer of the call option has the right to buy the underlying at the strike price at or before expiration. For example, if I own a fund like QQQ for the NASDAQ 100 and I think it's going to be relatively flat for the next 30 days or so, I might sell a call option on it, for which I receive cash immediately called the premium. The buyer of that call option is hoping QQQ goes up. As the seller, I'm hoping it stays flat. Call options are usually sold to generate income in a flat or mild bear market. Covered calls are also referred to as a buy right strategy, i.e. buying something and writing an option on that thing. This strategy allows covered call ETFs to have huge distribution yields upwards of 10% that typically pay monthly, making them attractive to income investors and retirees. That yield may be classified and taxed as return of capital or ROC or ordinary income, depending on the year. That is, those dividends, which are technically really not dividends, but rather distributions from option premiums, are not considered qualified dividends. A covered call ETF may be suitable for your portfolio if you desire a yield-focused strategy for current income, with the trade-offs being greater fees, the average covered call ETF expense ratio is 0.71%, muted long-term total returns, less diversification, lower portfolio efficiency, and possibly greater tax costs. Because of these things, recognize that it inarguably makes little sense for the young accumulator with a long time horizon to own a covered call ETF. Short back tests in recent years paint a somewhat unrealistically rosy picture for covered call funds. If we go back to PBP's inception in 2007 and look through 2022, we can see a visualization of the shortcomings I mentioned, mainly that covered calls are not an efficient way to de-risk a portfolio and they tend to hamper long-term returns. Novice investors seem to have this idea that the income from these expensive buy right funds are free money and that selling shares of a low-cost index fund like VTI to realize gains of an equal amount is somehow inferior to receiving a monthly distribution. Neither of these things is true. This irrational preference of dividends as income is just a well-documented and admittedly understandable mental accounting fallacy. Removing that high yield, the capital appreciation component of some of these funds has actually been negative since inception, as is the case for QYLD or Q yield. Proponents seem to erroneously believe that covered call ETFs are somehow made safe by their selling options. This is provably false, as we easily showed earlier. The promises and benefits touted by these funds and their supporters, such as greater sharp ratios, often don't hold water under the smallest amount of scrutiny, such as their objective inability to outperform the underlying index of their holdings, even on a risk-adjusted basis, much less a better diversified portfolio across asset classes like a 60-40. Basically, in market downturns, a covered call fund will fall with the market by an amount precisely equal to the market's drawdown minus the income received from the option premium. This doesn't even consider potential tax costs. You're taxed on any taxable distributions, regardless of whether or not you reinvest them. Thankfully, some of the distributions of covered call ETFs may be classified as return of capital, or ROC, meaning no taxes, until your cost basis is zero. And most of them have indeed been ROC in many years, but this hasn't always been the case. So that preferable tax treatment is by no means guaranteed. This was a big wake-up call for many QYLD investors in early 2022, when Global X announced that 100% of QYLD's distributions for 2021 would be classified as and thus taxed as ordinary income, not as ROC. Ouch. In fairness, novice investors likely see the extremely attractive high distribution yields of these funds and don't look much further, and they probably don't understand how covered calls work. The problem I hinted at earlier is that most new young investors are investing for retirement, have a very long time horizon, and don't need current income. So any advisor worth their salt would conclude that covered call funds are probably unsuitable for them. Don't succumb to mental accounting bias. The premium received doesn't mean much if the market crashes. At the end of the day, total return is what matters, period. 
I suspect income investors who own these funds perhaps simply aren't being honest with themselves by selectively ignoring their long-term total returns compared to a benchmark like the S&P 500 or 60-40 and instead are just focusing on that juicy monthly yield. Discussing and celebrating that yield, such as in dividend-focused communities on Reddit, usually just seem to be a click of confirmation bias. In my opinion, complex funds like these are usually just a great way for asset managers to extract more fees at the detriment of retail investors. I'm a fan of simply selling shares as needed for any income needed, which should be mathematically preferable anyway if you don't actually need that income on a monthly basis, as it allows you to leave more money in the market longer. On this point, proponents of covered call funds may concede that they're not great for young investors, but they still like to claim that these products are a crucial component for retirees. The story goes something like this. For the retiree, current income is used monthly for expenses and thus should be an important focus. So the high distribution yield from a covered call fund makes for a higher safe withdrawal rate because it allows you to avoid dipping into the principal as much, which is particularly useful during crashes and bear markets. This sounds nice and arguably even sensible, but upon empirical investigation, this argument doesn't hold much water either, at least over the past 15 years. Using live fund data, here's a backtest for the period 2008 through 2022 for PBP, the covered call ETF from Invesco for the S&P 500 that we covered earlier. A 60-40 portfolio using PBP for the equity side and a classic 60-40 portfolio using a starting balance of $1 million and monthly withdrawals of $5,000 adjusted for inflation. After 15 years, final balances would be $186,000, $320,000, and $853,000 respectively. The safe withdrawal rates or SWR of these portfolios for that period were 6.89%, 7.59%, and 9.09% respectively. Conveniently, this backtest includes the major drawdowns of 2008, 2018, and 2022, giving us a pretty good stress test. Once again, thinking of yield as income separate from principal, while it may make you feel better, is just mental accounting with no magical benefits. Total return is what matters. If one is set on using yield as income, you've also got other cheaper, more efficient options like REITs, dividend stocks, junk bonds, etc. I designed a dividend portfolio for income investors here that may appeal to you. Even if you hate bonds, we can construct a demonstrably superior strategy to QYLD, for example, with even the simplest naive mix of 50% NASDAQ 100 and 50% T-bills, which are the risk-free asset. I've got a link to that portfolio in the description if you're interested. To be fair, covered call funds certainly aren't the worst way I've seen to try to generate income. We'd expect buy-right strategies to outperform over brief periods of flat or mild bear markets when other assets like stocks and bonds are all declining, such as we saw for some months in the past few years. So some small allocation to a covered call fund may be warranted for the income investor or retiree. To see me specifically break down QYLD and suggest some superior alternatives, I've got a video on that here. What do you think of covered calls? Do you own any covered call ETFs? Let me know in the comments. Thanks for watching.